Hello, everyone. Uh, we're back on air, Unisoft Law YouTube show. And uh, today I have another fascinating guest. And uh, her name is Kayla Cardinal LaFrance. She uh, is a recent uh, law graduate. She's from Quebec. And I have so many questions for her. I uh, met Kayla through OBA, where we both volunteered. And without further ado, I will let Kayla introduce uh, herself and tell uh, the viewers uh, about uh, where she works right now, what is she up to, and what law school she went to. So a brief bio, if you will. A brief bio, OK. <laughs> well, uh, I went to uh, the University of Ottawa uh, first in the civil law faculty, and then later I did the national program. And I guess we'll talk about that because uh, there was a bit of a break in between when I finished civil law and did the national program to uh, get into common law uh, to get the JD. Uh, I recently passed the bar in, and got uh, called to the bar in January 2020 and got my first full-fledged lawyer job in uh, March of this year, right before the pandemic. And uh, now I'm working in, uh, in and around um, the Prescott-Russell region in Ontario, uh, which is a, I would call it like a border town between Ontario and Quebec, uh, specifically in Hawkesbury is the border town. And uh, I'm a community uh, legal clinic lawyer. Very interesting. I recently had an uh, interviewed my uh, good old friend Omar Hareda, who is executive director of Durham Community Legal Clinic. I think you watched that interview, didn't, didn't you? Yes, I did. Absolutely. Yeah. Is very the legal interesting. Clinic... He's very knowledgeable. Yeah. And the legal clinic where you work at right now, uh, what is it called? It's called Clinique Juridique de Prescott Russell. Uh, there's no, it, it's funny, there's no English version uh, of the name because it's a designated French uh, clinic. Mm -hmm. So this clinic serves the Francophone population of that particular region of Ontario, correct? Uh, not only the Francophone population. So my bilingual skills come in handy because we mm -hmm. do have a lot of English speaking people as well in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there's a predominance of French. Uh, I would say 70% of the work here is done in French. So French mm -hmm. common law. Where are you originally from, Kayla? So uh, I was uh, born in Montreal, but very soon after I uh, moved to the Gatineau region, uh, specifically in a very small town called Masson-Angers, which is now part of Gatineau. Um, and I grew up in, uh, in the outskirts of uh, Ottawa Gatineau, yeah. You said something very interesting about your law school experience. So you went to University of Ottawa, uh, didn't you? Yes, I did, yeah. And then uh, you, you split your uh, training uh, into two parts. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, we're diving deep into, <laughs> into uh, how I felt during law school and that kind of thing. Um, I was very young when I first started law. Uh, in, if, you, if you're not familiar with civil law, you can get in pretty quickly based on your grades. And I was admitted at the age of 18 in uh, civil law. And the competition was very strong. I didn't feel like I fit in. I came in with, uh, you know, no preparation, nothing, just admitted starting September with a dream and not knowing anything about the process, right? And I got... Uh, really, really challenged, really, really challenged. And so it, the results were the results. It, it, it wasn't the best first year. I don't think I have uh, glowing grades from that year, but um, 
after speaking with many people, people just said, you know what, just do it. Let them kick you out. Don't give up. Just go through the motions and see what happens. And, it, you know, if you're not cut out for it, they're going to kick you out. So what's, what's the worry? And I was like, okay. But, you know, as us, as new law people, uh, we, we're, we come from great grades previously and to now be at the bottom of the pack. It's kind of humbling, to say the least. So I was part of that group, right? And um, after a while, the competition really got to me and I felt I didn't fit in anything like that. So when I graduated, I said, you know, I don't think I'm ready for this. I graduated when I was uh, 22 and uh, I don't think I'm cut out for this and I'm just gonna go work. I'm going to go work. I'm going to get some uh, work experience and that kind of thing. And, you know, law school is always going to exist. The bar is always going to exist. So I'm just going to do what I think is right. So I was taking a chance and, you know, slightly giving up. Um, so what was great about going to work is I got to know my value on the marketplace, like on the uh, what, what I was worth uh what i could contribute to any organization which you know when you're a very young person and you haven't worked yet it's hard to know how you you place yourself you're just basing yourself off of your what your academic grades as if that really translates into your workplace performance um and with a couple of years i saw how some people who had great grades in law school decided to change careers and some people who were kind of maybe more average were doing great. And I was stuck in certain, in a, you know, certain organizations. They, they gave me a lot of opportunities, but a part of me wanted more responsibility. And I was already, already acting as if I should have more responsibility and that kind of thing. And I realized, well, maybe I should just go back and finish what I intended to do and uh, get the, do the national program, get the JD and have that dual training, pass the bar and try it out as a lawyer. The worst that can happen is I'm going back to the job I currently have. That's the worst that can happen. So why not? Wait, so you finished uh, the civil program though before you started working, right? Correct, yes. So you started the civil program at 18 and then yes. how long, how many years did it take? Oh, well, see, I wanted to be special. So I didn't do the normal civil law program. I did a special combined dual degree civil law program. So I did civil law and international development. That takes four years. So you have a master's degree in international development? Uh, no, it's a bachelor's. It's a bachelor's. Oh, it's a bachelor's. Oh, I see. So that was an undergraduate law program, right? I, it's hard to know. It, they call it a license. So ah, you are, you are licensed to practice civil law. And, and that was offered by University of Ottawa. Yeah. Sorry, but, you can't practice law once you get the degree. You still have to go do the Quebec bar. But uh -huh. um, you, you, you get a license from, uh, uh -huh. from the program. So you finish the civil program, let's say at, at U Ottawa or University of Montreal, right? other Quebec universities must offer it, right? Yes. And then it takes normally three years, it took you four years, because you also did uh, the international development program. But after you finish this program, even if you start at 18, you can take the Quebec bar exam? Um, after you finish the program, yeah, that's the way to do it. You, do, oh, you wow, get your license and you, and you, uh, you go do the uh, Quebec bar. Que Quebec bar. Um, Okay, so uh, you, you started working. What did you do during your uh, intermission between the civil program and the common law program, which you then returned to, uh, when you returned to the University of Ottawa? <laughs> I did uh, anything and everything. <laughs> it was really just, I don't know where I'm going now. So I went literally to, well, first I, I was a tour guide for a little bit and uh, I had been doing that for three years, so I, I, I stopped doing that. But after I stopped, I was like, what, what else could I do? I don't know which organization I want to work with. I don't know 
who I am yet, you know, <laughs> like I just, and so I came up with the idea of just going to a placement agency. And for a while, while I was thinking, uh, I was replacing all the sick receptionists <laughs> in the downtown Ottawa area. So I'd get a call in the morning. Yep. This organization needs a, uh, uh, a replacement today and I'd head over. Uh, it was literally like day to day. I, I, I got little jobs like that. And um, then I worked for um, uh, more like not for profit organizations to very uh, administrative type roles. <laughs> I love your sense of humor, by the way. <laughs> so at some point you decided to stop replacing sick receptionists and yes. <laughs> do something else. So what happened? Um, I got more um, permanent jobs. Uh, so eventually someone wanted to me wanted me to be an executive assistant and I got they, they liked my work and so they hire you. And uh, I was doing that for a fair bit. And uh, I just noticed that I had a lot to give. And the executive assistant role was making me learn a lot of things and making me grow. But I knew that at some point I was going to plateau. And a year in, I was like already seeing the end. And I figured if I don't make a decision now, it's just going to be harder and harder and harder to get back to going back to school. Um, I had a couple of other odd jobs after that. Um, again, through the placement agency, uh, sometimes in government, that kind of thing. Um, and finally, I just registered and got accepted again, all over again. And I was finally excited to, to, to go back as a, a, a more mature student. And I, 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 there's something to be said about doing a law degree when you're a bit older, you have a lot more perspective and the culture that's in law school gets to you less because you have a life outside of it. So, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you returned to University of Ottawa for the common law JD program now, this time. Uh, correct. Uh, it's specifically the national program, which is an additional year that you do to get the JD. Because as some, maybe people don't know, but when you do civil law, you still have to do all the federal courses, right? right so right. we've done a bunch of common law already. We just right. need that extra year to do more private uh, uh, provincial stuff. Yeah. I see. I see. So essentially you, you needed to do only one extra year to get your JD. Right. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's really good. So uh, I'm really curious about comparing the civil program with the common law program. Uh, how, how did you find they differ? The civil law program... Uh, there, there, there's generally speaking a different culture uh, there. Uh, there's cultural differences with the people who apply, of course, um, and get accepted. Um, uh, I think because common law, you have to have a degree before you apply. Generally speaking, people are more I don't like to say that they're more mature. They're just older, you know? So they, they, they've done a degree before. They know how a university works. Uh, they know the level of intensity you have to work at to get good grades. Uh, civil law, we were very young. A lot, there was a lot of people like me who were just admitted uh, at 18. And um, to know that you're going to be a lawyer at 18 is... Um, it's a huge ego boost and that comes with certain personality consequences <laughs> and uh, big egos, you know. Um, I really appreciated my common law experience, even though most of the common law people I were, was with were um, from the civil law program. So, you know, it's... Uh, Kayla, 
uh, was the language of instruction in the civil law program French? It was French, yes. But you could write, at Ottawa U, you can write your exam in the language of your choice. Your, your law school exams in, yes. in all subjects? Yes. I see, I see. But not so in uh, Quebec schools, right? Uh, I'm unfamiliar. I think that's more uh, University of Ottawa specific. Yeah. Right. I, I'm curious, after you finished the civil law program at University of Ottawa, did you uh, obtain your license to practice law in Quebec? No, no. I was that discouraged. Right. And, Interesting. Yeah. But then it took some work experience and maybe uh, introspection and finally one more year at the JD program for you to, to decide that you're ready to uh, get called to the bar and become a lawyer. Yes, I think, um, I think my, my stunt in the workforce was, uh, uh, sorry, my, not my stunt, my stint in the workforce was um, uh, uh, a confidence builder, right? And I did just that extra year made me feel like, oh, I can actually do this. What was I thinking? What was I so afraid of? Right. I can actually do this. And I got decent grades uh, during that uh, year. And then I decided to do the um, law practice program, the French one that's offered at the University of Ottawa. And the law practice program really gave me a lot of confidence, a lot. Yeah. How did you find your way to the OBA and how, how did it begin? At, at what point in your uh, law school path did your relationship with the OBA start? Uh, during the law practice program. Uh, I had just, it just dawned on me that um, I hadn't really maximized all the opportunities I had in law school especially when I was younger, because I was just so lost and trying to keep up, just keeping my head above water. Um, I didn't have time to get involved in any sort of activity or extracurricular or anything. Like it was just that much work for me, for a person in my situation. Um, and I, I didn't particularly have the motivation to go beyond concentrating on my courses. Once I got into the law practice program, I really started to understand the uh, importance of networking. I already understood that it was important, but uh, the importance of getting involved in organizations. I've always been a bit of an individualist. I like talking to everybody. I try and talk to as many people as possible, but for me to join a group is just, <laughs> There's a comedian out there who says, you know, who joins a group, you know, <laughs> um, and I, I, I resonated with that for a long time. I, I really refused being part of any groups, um, just really stubborn about that. Well, and you hit it very well when you worked uh, at the OBA together with me. It didn't look like at all like you were uncomfortable and you did an amazing job. No, and I, I would agree that came with uh, a bit of age, a bit of experience and learning to appreciate the, the value in cooperation and the value in uh, collaboration. Uh, that, that came much later in my life. Mm -hmm. So that value was a new value and uh, I was really embracing it at that point, yeah. You were born in Quebec you grew up in Quebec and you live in Quebec right now also, correct? Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. And you crossed the river to go to work. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel francophone when you go to Ontario every day? Do you feel like you are crossing uh, a, a border or that you're crossing a cultural border or that you're an outsider at all? Um. I feel an out, like an outsider at home. So um, I thought that by crossing the, uh, so let's just unpack that maybe. Um, I always felt like I didn't fit in, even as a, a, a child, you know? So uh, a part of me had wished that uh, by going to Ontario and uh, 
you know, having a career in Ontario, maybe it was cultural. Maybe I, I didn't fit into Quebec, but I would fit into Ontario. And then, then I realized I didn't fit into Ontario either. So I was like, oh no, <laughs> what do I do? Uh, it must be me. <laughs> and so uh, fitting in has just been uh, uh, put on the back burner. I just have to get comfortable being myself, no matter the environment of where I am or who I'm with. Um, the whole francophone thing you would think would um, impact me a lot, but my identity, I feel very strongly about being bilingual and bicultural. Um, I never pick between both because I don't feel like I'm one more than the other. I very much studied in both languages. I've, I have parents who speak both languages. Um, I've worked in both languages. So I, and I, and that's the thing, I, I consume media and art in both languages as well. So for me to say, oh, I'm Francophone doesn't really make sense because I'm also Anglophone and culturally also, I, I, I have that duality. And uh, so, so I, I, I refuse to pick, I, repu I refuse to pick sides. And when I cross the border, um, it kind of confirms who I am. It's just, I'm working in a border town and I'm kind of a border person. I, I, I've always lived in these types of regions that had to cross the river. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. You said that you don't pick um, uh, between uh, Francophone or Anglophone, you're both. So I, I, take, I take it as uh, you, you don't take sides. You don't uh, have a favorite identity. You have a dual identity, but then, I've always wondered about uh, dual identities and uh, it's really a fascinating topic. And Canada is one of the unique countries in the world that has a large linguistic minority that has a huge influence on the national policy and the national legal system. So the United States, which is the closest to Canada in culture is, is very different in that respect. There is, there is a huge linguistic minority, the Spanish speaking minority, but they are not in the system, so to speak, right? Uh, the, the, their rights are not enshrined to the effect, to the same extent as the rights of the Francophone community are enshrined in Canada, even in the Canadian constitution. So uh, it's really important for Canada, in my view, to uh, understand and all for all Canadians to understand people uh, who are francophone and people who are dual or bicultural like you this is really interesting and uh, I, I still want to go back to that uh, question of crossing lines and crossing borders uh, and ask you so let's say you go to work in the morning right you go to Ontario and you come to uh, your workplace but then you told me that it's uh, a mostly francophone clientele that you were deal with uh, is the language that you hear in the office french or do you also hear english or both oh well my the language that i hear at work at the moment very french very french um i'm definitely the token Anglo speaking person there. Yeah. English speaking person. Um, it comes across subtly, but it's just sometimes uh, because I'm new to the region, certain expressions, you know, the French that's spoken in, in the region, they have like a very flowery metaphor expressions. And every once in a while, I catch myself not understanding what the expression was. And, and then they see my deer in headlights look, and then they say, Oh, it means this, this, this. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. We, because to me, if if my father doesn't say it, and if my grandfather doesn't say it, 
I tend not to know it. So, and they're not from the region I, I'm currently working in. So, um, yeah, that's the only times it really shows. Um, maybe some people who are a bit um, snooty, snootier about language might notice the little mishaps here and there that I make that I make in English and that I also make in French. So it goes, no matter which language I speak, uh, some people say I have an accent in both languages. Some people say, no, you have, you're perfectly bilingual. I can't even hear uh, any hint of anything. So it's you really- work on C You could work on CBC, both CBC and Radio Canada. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question. Uh, do you make court submissions in French? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, have you had a chance to make oral submissions or only written submissions so far? So far, uh, I've only had simulated at the law practice program, but it's right. upcoming very shortly. So that's the reason why I picked this job. I said, listen, I want, a, I want a place that can benefit from my bilingualism and I want to plead in English. I want to plead in French. I want both and I need a place that supports both. So your, your job entails uh, litigation, correct? Uh, yeah, more like uh, landlord and tenant board Tra stuff. Tribunals, uh, tribunals, tribunals, a lot yeah. of tribunal work then. Okay, so do you expect to uh, make submissions to a French uh, speaking adjudicator anytime soon in Ontario? Uh, yes, we have to, or at the very least a bilingual one, right? Depends how you use the word French there, but... Uh, um, yes, we have a lot of clientele that's uh, French speaking, so we necessarily have to always do the check boxes. Yes, we must have it in French. Uh, right. And, the, you know, that comes with its share of delays. But right. um, we, we have to because it's one of our, our, our main goals is to increase access to justice for, for French speaking people in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And does your local area have uh, a a landlord and tenant board uh, branch, uh, or do you have to go to Ottawa? How does it work? Oh, well, I'm not still familiar with all the intricacies of it. Because of the pandemic, uh, my, my training uh, has been expanded, yeah. so it's very it slow. But it's uh, the moratorium on evictions has just been lifted, so I'm sure I'm going to be uh, um, more knowledgeable about that aspect soon. I'm just very curious about hearing uh, French in our courtrooms. I've never heard French in Tor Toronto courtrooms, for example. That's where I usually spend my days. Um, and uh, I haven't heard French in Toronto tribunals, but of course I never acted on matters that were conducted in French. But I know that uh, we have Francophone judges or French speaking judges in all levels of court. So I'm just curious if there is a higher concentration of adjudicators and judges who speak French and who accept submissions in French in certain areas of Ontario, such mm. as, you know, where Francophone community lives, such as the area where you, for example, practice. Well, I'm really curious about that. Do you know anything about it? Well, they have to accept that we're doing it in French, but, um, at least at the tribunals that I deal with. And uh, however, on the judge or the member of the tribunal, um, uh, we tend to always see the same faces because there's not that many. So mm -hmm. sometimes we, we have a, there's, there's a bit of a token person who speaks French who does most of our cases, yeah. Right. So not, not only, the, not only does everyone have a problem of access to justice because there are not enough judges, not enough adjudicators, that in and of itself is an issue in Canada, but then there is an additional issue for the Francophone community that there are not even fewer, uh, let's say in Ontario, I, I'm not talking about Quebec, there are even fewer French speaking adjudicators and judges. So that's probably a uh, unique access to justice issue that's unique to the French speaking community of Ontario. Yeah, absolutely. And it's what interests me about, uh, about this, uh, this job is that um, I can actually advocate for linguistic rights on a regular basis, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
I want to promote access to justice in both languages, in both official languages. So if I were to, again, cross the border to Quebec, I would want to advocate for the English speaking population to have proper service in English. And I would like to see a similar situation happen in Ontario. And I think Ontario is lagging behind Quebec in this respect. Uh, when you read reported decisions, you know, court cases and such, do you prefer to read them in, let, let's say, Supreme Court of Canada decisions? Like, we all like to read them every once in a while, even though not all of us practice in the Supreme Court. Do you prefer to read them in English or in French? I prefer to read them in the language that they were written in. Oh, the, wow. Like the judge, what's, what does the judge uh, speak? And I want this to read is it the that best. way. Just like a this movie. Just like a movie. Yeah, exactly. Or the book, right? Right. So I, I feel this is a, a gap in my experience as a lawyer. I, I, I do not hear from French speaking judges because even though I can speak French, you know, we did exchange some French uh, phrases uh, when we were warming up for this interview, but uh, my French is really street French. It's very conversational. There's no way I can read a reported decision in French, but then it means that I am missing a, a part of our legal tradition, a part of our legal system. I'm simply not hearing from it. It's completely closed off to me because there is a subset of decisions that are written in French. They may or may not be translated into English, but we know that translation uh, usually uh, reduces the signal, right? Or reduces the, or changes the meaning a little bit. Uh, have you ever um, come across cases where the difference in uh, the language of, of the text, of whether the case or a statute made a difference? I, I remember hearing something that someone made a, a, a whole argument based on the fact that the French translation, not even necessarily the original of a certain statute or even you know maybe the constitution i'm not sure what that case was about actually had a different meaning from the english version have you ever come across anything like that uh, people trying to make a legal argument out of it uh yeah absolutely it's a key feature for bilingual lawyers to use um it's uh it's always to your advantage to but it, you have to you have to really master both languages because it's subtleties of the language it's stuff about commas and you know the, the uh -huh. small stuff and if you're right. into that yeah. you need to use it especially if you're bilingual um so uh i i i don't know them by heart i'm not that much of an expert yet but i do plan on becoming one <laughs> and uh yeah that is very much something i want to leverage and mm. uh get an advantage on and it's very refreshing to hear that uh, a person uh, other than, you know, I would say a little bit outside of the uh, Francophone legal community uh, realizes that there's some decisions you've, you haven't really, you know, read properly or, yeah. you, know, you know, properly is a, you know. A, or, 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 or uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, put myself on the screen here, uh, or uh, a whole set of decisions are, I'm excluded from them because of my ignorance uh, of the language or lack of sufficient command of the language. I'm simply excluding myself. I ex I'm excluding myself from this subset of our legal uh, uh, tradition, of our legal culture, of our legal texts, mm -hmm. right? and. Uh, I think any, every Canadian should have some knowledge of French. Just, you know, it would be great if most Canadians who are Anglo uh, or English speaking, if they spoke some French at least, but uh, I, I think it's really great if, if most lawyers also can read Fra Francophone uh, or French speaking judges decisions or decisions in French. Uh, it would be really interesting for me also to see if there's any cultural difference in uh, legal reasoning across this chasm, across linguistic chasm, because correct me if I'm wrong, but 
I assume that most judges who write decisions in French are also culturally francophone. I mean, this would make sense, right? I mean, I'm sure there are judges who are Anglos, but who also have excellent command of French, and they're going to have access to um, French cases in Ontario. But my, my guess, and maybe I'm wrong, I'm really curious just to hear what you have to say about it. My guess is uh, judges who write decisions in French in Ontario are probably Franco-Ontarien. Huh. It's, uh, it's hard to say. I see a lot of uh, appointed judges who are uh, more Anglophone. Um, and um, who, who say they are bilingual, right? Um, there's something to be said about not being French first and hearing a French case. There's mm -hmm. stuff that gets, again, we're talking about mm -hmm. translation. It's lost in translation, mm -hmm. lost exactly. in the interpretation. Um, but then you, you, you come across a, a wall where it's like, oh, okay, well, what are we going to say? You have to be absolutely perfectly bilingual to, to be appointed to a position like a judge. And it's like, well, you know, it's, it, again, it depends. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I hope we're striving in that direction, that uh, Ontario lawyers and Canadian lawyers at large are, are striving towards increased bilingualism so that we don't have to have these discussions, you know, these uncomfortable discussions. So maybe we're not there yet as a society, but I'm a huge crusader for bilingualism. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Francophones who don't speak English need to learn English. English speakers who don't know French need to learn French. Uh, and if you can't do it in your generation, make sure that your kids do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the future is for people who speak both languages or you know, at, at the very least, multiple languages, but, you know, start with the first, the two official languages in Canada. That'd be a good start if you're, all, if you're unilingual. Yeah. Uh, on this note, which uh, I definitely uh, support you on very, very much. I myself uh, am bilingual and I know the benefit of uh, speaking other languages. I uh, want to say uh, thank you. This has been uh, a great conversation. You're one of those rare guests, uh, very unique guests. I haven't had a Francophone uh, slash Anglophone guest yet. And we definitely touched on some important issues that are not just of special interest to Francophones or people who support them, but to any lawyer in Ontario. Uh, so I thank you for expressing your views and sharing this useful information today. Kayla, and uh, I hope uh, to have you back maybe later when uh, you uh, have another milestone in your career. Thank you so much, Kayla. Well, thank you for having me. It's been really nice chatting as, as always. <laughs> Thanks, Kayla.